to welcome Professor Martin Barlow to the Ashok Maitra Memorial Lectures. It's uh, uh, one of the very prestigious lecture series that ISI colleagues and ISI organize. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the speaker today. Uh, Professor Martin Barlow, University of British Columbia, received his undergraduate degree from Cambridge University and his PhD from the University of Wales in 1979. His PhD supervisor was David Williams. He has held appointments at Liverpool University, the University of Cambridge, and the University of British Columbia. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1995 and of the Royal Society London in 2006. He gave an invited talk at the 1990 International Congress of Mathematicians. With that very brief introduction, May I invite Professor Barlow to please deliver his speech today. Thank you very much for the in, in introduction and um, invitation. Um, I'm very pleased to be invited to give these lectures. As Siva says, it's a shame I can't actually uh, be present, but um, uh, here we go anyway. So um, the, oh, wait a minute now, let's just pardon the technological challenges. Um, with these lectures. So let me just give you, start with a brief plan of the lectures today. Um, I think in the past, people visited different sites and they may have given um, uh, sort of sp specialist lectures on this and that topic. Um, today, I ventured to give a, basically a very short course called um, Harnack Inequalities. In fact, we'll go back to the title from PDE to random graphs. So. The lectures today are going to be mainly um, uh, introductory. Um, uh, so I won't be telling you things which are um, very new in terms of research, but nevertheless, I hope that um, uh, most of you will be will learn something from um, today's lectures. And then um, on Thursday, in the last two lectures, I'm going to take the ideas that I've introduced today and will um, give uh, two sets of applications on first lecture on Thursday to random graphs, such as random walks on percolation. And then in lecture four on what I call fractal graphs, and you'll see what those mean in, in a bit. Um, and the question of the stability of elliptic Harnack inequality. And so the brief plan of the lectures um, is that we'll see how methods developed by researchers in partial differential equations quite a long time ago can be used to study Markov processes um, in a number of um, diverse settings. So let's get going. And um, uh, I want to begin by defining um, uh, a harmonic function. So we've got a Markov process on a, on a metric space and we use usual notation PX for the law of the Markov process started to point X. We define the exit time from a domain tau D to be the here the first time that the process leaves the um, set D. And the first definition of a harmonic function is that the, if we apply H, that is not well written, it should have been H of XT with a close bracket there. So we look at the H of XT, but we stop that process at the point when T, um, when the process leaves the domain. H of XT is a local martingale. And an equivalent defin definition is that if we define the infinitesimal generator of the um, Markov process in this way, then a harmonic function is, uh, H is harmonic if the generator applied to H is zero. And because the notion of harmonic is related to the process X, um, we may also want to say um, the process is X harmonic. And let me just note by sort of color coding here, um, remarks in sort of, um, green are intended to be sort of side remarks, which can be um, omitted if you um, prefer, or at least. Okay, so let's proceed now to look at a couple of examples of infinitesimal generators. So perhaps we'll start actually with number two, um, Brownian motion on RD, um, Laplacian this is the standard Laplacian um, d2 f dxi squared, sum from one to d. 
then the infinitesimal generator of Brownian motion is a half Laplacian. And so the LW, well, LW is a half Laplacian. And in this case, harmonic with respect to Brownian motion is just the standard definition of harmonic. If we look at a continuous time Markov chain on a countable set V with jump rates AXY, so that we have this um, uh, property here for small h, then the infinitesimal generator is just the sum over y, axy, fy minus fx. And now let's go on to look at the definition of the um, elliptic Harnack inequality. And we say that, um, I guess, the space and the process satisfies the elliptic Harnack inequality if there's a constant ch independent of um, depending only on these three objects, such that whenever you've got a ball in the space and a non-negative harmonic function um, in the ball, then we have this inequality here, and B prime is the ball center X and radius half the um, radius of the ball capital B. So what this inequality here is saying is it gives us some control over the um, ratio of the biggest and smallest values of the function h in this ball b prime. Um, if you're a probabilist, it's not quite clear what the probabilistic significance of the elliptic Harnack inequality is. In fact, um, I would say there isn't really a, a clean probabilistic property that tra translates to the elliptic Harnack inequality. But, um, uh, to get a general idea of a meaning, let's look at the following picture here. A typical harmonic function would be um, the probability that the process exits in a um, subset A of the boundary. So we have here the ball B, here's the boundary, here's the ball B prime. And what the elliptic Harnack inequality tells us is that if we look at the probability of exiting the ball um, via the set A, then the best point and the worst point in the set B prime are the, you know, the ratio is only going to be um, uh, controlled by, um, the ratio is, 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 is bounded above. So it gives some kind of mixing of the process um, uh, in, the, um, in the smaller ball before we get, before we leave the bigger ball. So that's sort of the, um, should at any rate give some sort of rough idea of what the um, elliptic Harnack inequality is about. So let's go on and look at a, a brief history of these um, inequalities. Um, this is why it's called the Harnack inequality, a theorem Harnack in 1887. So this of course was looking at harmonic functions in the classical sense. <clears throat> so we have a harmonic function on a ball um, then for any x in a smaller ball, we have the following um, uh, inequality um, with explicit constants on the ratio of h of x over h of zero. And if you um, remember, recall from um, appropriate courses, the Poisson formula, then um, we can write down h of x explicitly um, in, in this way. Here, sigma is surface, um, measure on the boundary of this ball here. And um, using the Poisson formula, Harnack's theorem comes out easily. And if you've got Harnack's theorem here, the elliptic Harnack inequality, as stated in the previous slide, is just controlling the ratios of h of x over h of zero. And it follows immediately um, from, in this case, from Harnack's theorem. So now let's go on um, about 60 years from Harnack. And let me briefly tell you what a divergence form PDE in RD is. So we have um, a symmetric matrix of functions, AIJ of X, X in RD. And we assume that it's uniformly elliptic. In other words, um, if we look at this quantity here, it's bounded below by um, this quantity and bounded above by this quantity for some um, a fixed constant A, um, uh, which has to be bigger than or equal to one, um, as we see. We now define um, uh, a differential operator L 
subscript little a. If you're a D person, you would write it in that form, um, expanding things out like that. Um, let me comment that uh, looking at it like this, if you're unfamiliar with PDE, you'd think that the AIJs have to be at least, um, uh, have at least one derivative, but there are PDE methods associated with weak solutions, which enable one to make sense of this um, PDE, um, even with much weaker um, continuity conditions on the AIJ. In fact, even without continuity conditions on the AIJ. So the elliptic for divergence form PDE in the domain D um, takes the following form. We fix a function G on the boundary of D and we look at the um, equations here that the function is equal to G on the boundary and LAF is zero inside the domain. If you're a probabilist, there's a diffusion process associated with this operator and then f of x is just the expected value of g of x at the exit point on the domain. So continuing with the brief history, um, a major open problem um, in the 1950s, um, there are classical Schauder estimates um, obtained in the 1930s for PDEs, but they required um, undesirable regularity on the functions AIJ. And a major open problem was to go beyond those estimates to obtain a regularity for solutions of the divergence form PDE as given above. What in fact people wanted was regularity estimates which just depended on the constant A and not on any additional um, Lipschitz or Holder um, conditions involving the AIJ. And this problem was solved independently by De Georgi, Nash, and Moser um, in the sort of period 1957 to 1960. If you read the biography of um, Nash, uh, there's the suggestion that um, uh, if there had been fewer people who'd solved the problem, um, then um, a Fields Medal would have been awarded um, for it. But with three people essentially solving the same problem, the Fields Medal Committee um, felt that, um, the Fields Medal Committee for 1960 felt that giving three Fields Medals for this problem was too many. And so they decided to give um, none. Um, actually, they only gave field, two Fields Medals in 1960, um, but um, there we are. So um, although I've said it was solved in the late 1950s, Moser's paper actually appeared in 1961 and he proved an elliptic Harnack inequality for solutions to divergence form PDE. In other words, he showed that if you've got a function which is satisfies LAH equals zero in a domain, then the elliptic Harnack inequality holds. And that gave the desired regularity for these equations. Um, in 1964, he proved a stronger parabolic Harnack inequality, which I'll be explaining in a few slides for solutions to the heat equation. Um, there's a certain amount of development which I've omitted here in this, in this um, slide. Aronson used Moser's methods to prove Gaussian bounds for solutions to the divergence form PDE. In 1972, Bombieri and Giusti um, made the translation of Moser's methods to prove an elliptic Harnack inequality in the context of manifolds. In 1986, um, Fabes and Struck went back and showed how Nash's methods, Nash was able to prove re regularity of the PDE, but didn't prove a Harnack inequality. But Fabes and Struck showed how going just a bit further, Nash could have proved um, uh, the parabolic Harnack inequality. And also Fabes and Struck um, made more explicit the two-way connection between the parabolic Harnack inequality, which I haven't yet explained, and Gaussian heat kernel bounds, which I'll also be explaining soon. Um, Li Yao um, proved parabolic Harnack inequality on man manifolds with positive curvature. I won't be saying much about that work, but I will be saying quite a bit about the work of Grigorian and Stolovkost independently in 1992, who gave a characterization of the parabolic Harnack inequality via conditions are, which are stable and often easy to check. And I'll be explaining what I mean by these terms um, uh, in a few minutes. And then the methods um, 
there were further extensions of these ideas to metric spaces by Theo Sturm and by graphs by Theo Dumot, who was a student of Sarovkost. And Dumot's work was about 1999. So that's a brief history of the um, uh, subject of um, Harnack inequalities. So before I, um, let's just see why um, they're useful. So here's a first application of the elliptic Harnack inequality to prove um, Holder continuity. So suppose we've got a function which is harmonic in a domain and we assume the elliptic Harnack inequality holds. We don't have to be very explicit here about the, um, the space that we're looking at. It could be a manifold, it could be a divergence form um, equation on RD, um, or it could be a graph. So we define the oscillation of um, the function h on a set b to be just the supremum of h minus the infimum of h. So supposing we've got a ball b here, we're going to rescale the function h so that the supremum on the ball b is u, the ball b is one and the infimum is zero. And also um, so that u at the center is bigger than or equal to half. Now we apply the elliptic Harnack inequality to the function u, which we can do. And the supremum of u on b prime is obviously bigger than or equal to half. The elliptic Harnack inequality tells us that that's less than ch times the infimum of u on b prime. So the infimum of u on b prime is bigger than this constant here. Let's write, call that constant delta. What we've seen is that the oscillation on b prime is less than one minus delta because the infimum is bigger than a um, delta and the supremum is less than one. So we have a compression of the oscillations of the function u on the ball. Um, b prime is less than one minus delta times the oscillation on the ball b. By linearity, this also holds for the function h. And so iterating, we get the equation here and um, unpacking that in a final inequality that we have here, we have the holder continuity of the function h. So the elliptic Harnack inequality um, uh, leads by a very simple argument to prove Holder continuity of harmonic functions. And a second application of the elliptic Harnack inequality is the Liouville property. So we say um, the space process satisfies the strong Liouville property if whenever you've got a non-negative harmonic function on the whole space, then the function is constant. And a simple theorem proved here is that Martin, if you have- uh, the a question in the chat that says that, can you choose a B so that the three conditions hold? I guess the previous slide, I guess. Um, uh, can I choose a B so that the three conditions hold? I don't- yeah, maybe can you ask a question? I need to ask questions. I don't quite understand the, that question. Yeah, one second. Uh, Bibi, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah. No, you see, you want to choose two constants A, B, so that three conditions hold. Can it be done? Um, so when you say the three conditions, I don't quite know. You mean this? Uh, oh, oh okay. here. Yes. Two problems, oh. One, two, two is zero. You have yes, zero. Oh, I see. Value. So can we choose A and B so that it's true? Well, first of all, what we would do is we would, um, I mean, if you think about the function H, the first thing we do is we take away the infimum of H to get a, a non-negative function. Then we divide the function by, uh, by its supremum to get a function which is um, between zero and one, and, and the infimum is zero and the supremum is one. And then if that function happens to have u of x less than a half, then we would replace that function by one minus u and we get a function which is bigger than or equal to half. So oh. um, yes, it is possible. Oh, thank you. Thanks, thanks. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> um, so if um, the process satisfies the elliptic Harnack inequality, that implies the strong Liouville property. So let's um, see it, it's a very short proof as you see. Suppose that we have a non-negative function which is non-constant and harmonic. 
we can replace the function by the infimum of h, but by h minus infimum of h. So we can assume that the infimum of h on the space is zero. So because the function is non-constant, there's got to be a point x in the space with h of x bigger than naught. Now let's choose another y in the space. Um, y in the space. We take a ball which is big enough to contain both the points um, x and y, and we apply the elliptic Hanak inequality in this ball. H of y is bigger than the infimum of h in this ball of radius, twice the distance between x and y. EHI gives us that it's bigger than this, and that in turn is bigger than CH to the minus one times h of x. So we have some global lower bound for the function h, which holds for all y in x. And we therefore deduce that the infimum of h is strictly bigger than naught, so we get a contradiction. So, I mean, there's, this is the quickest proof. If you don't like arguments by contradiction, one can easily do it in, in other ways. Let me remark that in RD, Harnack's theorem already shows us that um, the elliptic Harnack inequality holds, so the strong Liouville property holds. Um, and in probabilistic terms, the strong Liouville property is a statement that essentially there's only one way for the process to um, go out to infinity. So as you saw in the brief history, we saw how Moser's methods started off by being used for divergence form operators, but then had extensions to graphs, well, to um, manifolds, then um, metric, general metric spaces and graphs. And so I'm going to be mainly talking about, to, to avoid um, technical issues, continuous time simple random walks on weighted graphs. So let me briefly um, remind you what these are. So we take a connected graph, usually it's going to be infinite, and we have a collection of edge weights for the graph, which I'm going to call little a. And we call the triple here a weighted graph. And the natural weights for a weighted graph are where we just take a um, edge weight of one identically equal to one. It's going to be useful to extend the function, um, the weights a to a function a mapping v cross v um, on v cross v by defining axy to be zero if xy is not an edge and xy is just the weight of the edge xy if it is an edge. I'm also going to define ax to be the sum over y of axy. So in other words, the sum of the weights of the edges coming out of x. If we've got natural weights, then a of x is just simply the number of edges um, with an endpoint x. And this function little a is symmetric. And I'm going to assume no multiple edges or self loops. I'm going to assume the graph is locally finite. So each uh, point has only got finitely many edges coming out of it. And important notation, which I could be using lots, is we need to define balls in the space. Um, sometimes to emphasize the space that the ball is in, I'm going to write subscript G there. And the balls are simply the points where Y with distance between X and Y less than or equal to R. And the metric on the graph is the natural one. The distance between two points is simply the smallest number of hops that you have to make to get from X to Y if you are only allowed to hop along edges. And we can look at a random walk on the weighted graph. I'm going to be looking at the random walk in continuous time. And this is the process similar to the one where the example I gave you before of the infinitesimal generator. The probability of jumping from X to Y in a short period of time H is H times AXY over AX. So the process jumps from X to Y at rate AXY divided by AX. And a couple of key properties of this process. The first is um, it's reversible or symmetric. So we have this um, property here. And we're going to be looking at the heat kernel of the process. Now we've got a graph, so the natural things to do might be to think that we want to look at these um, transition probabilities here, but that's not symmetric unless AXY, unless A is constant. 
this object is actually a nicer object to handle sort of um, in terms of its, its properties. And it's just the density of the process X with respect to um, A, which we can regard as a measure. And the reversibility or symmetric is extremely important. Um, it tells in this setup, the operator LA, the infinitesimal generator of the process um, is self-adjoint with respect to A. And that symmetry or self-adjointness or reversibility is absolutely critical um, for the methods that I'm um, talking about. They just don't work at all well or at all for processes which don't have this symmetry property. Uh, that's a big restriction from a probabilist, but on the other hand, there are still an awful lot of very important processes which do have these symmetry properties. So our overall goal here is we have a weighted graph using various kinds of information about the geometry of the graph. We want to be able to talk about the long-term behavior of the random walk on the graph. And we're going to be particularly interested in obtaining estimates on the heat kernel PGXY. Um, this, of course, is the fundamental um, thing which describes the um, evolution of the process. And these heat kernel transition probabilities enable us to read off many properties of the process. For example, we have the, the process is transient if this integral here is um, finite. So I mentioned the parabolic Harnack inequality um, uh, a few slides ago, and now it's time to um, engage with it. Um, at first sight, it's a much less appealing object than the elliptic Harnack inequality, which is nice and simple. Uh, but anyway, we, we do have to engage with the parabolic Harnack inequality, um, as you'll see. And so let's um, do so. So let's start with the picture here. What we are looking at is a space-time cylinder. So here is in space, vertically is the ball BXR. Time is going horizontally. And we look at a space-time cylinder, which is the ball BXR cross zero T. And T here is um, equal to R squared. In this space-time cylinder, we make, we choose two smaller um, uh, space-time cylinders, Q minus and Q plus. Q minus meaning the earlier cylinder and Q plus the later one. Q minus, the spatially, these are, the ball is half the radius of um, BXR. And it goes from a quarter T to a half T. Q plus from three quarters T to T. So we're looking at, and now we're looking at a solution of the heat equation in this cylinder. And it's going to be useful to call solutions of the heat equation caloric functions. And I should mention an important example of such functions are, <clears throat> is the heat kernel, um, PTXY is always going to be in this context, a solution of the um, uh, heat equation. And the parabolic Harnack inequality then tells us that the supremum of the function over the earlier space-time cylinder is bounded above by the infimum of um, U on the later um, cylinder. Um, I always find it actually hard to remember which way around these, um, the parabolic Harnack inequality goes, um, but so um, there we are. Um, let me comment first that it's, I mentioned that it was str stronger than the elliptic Harnack inequality. That's easy to see. Supposing we've got a ha ordinary harmonic function in B and we'd set uxt equals h of x, then du by dt is zero, LH is zero, so we've got zero equals zero here. So this function here is caloric, in other words, a solution of the heat equation. And if you look at the infimum, at what, because there's no time element, the supremum here is just the supremum of H over the ball B prime B a half X a half R, and the infimum is similarly the infimum of you on that. And so we're back to the um, uh, elliptic Harnack inequality that we saw earlier. So um, there is the parabolic Harnack inequality. Um, it gives a similar regularity of solutions to the heat equation that the elliptic Harnack inequality gave to the um, sort of um, Laplace equation. 
And the reason I wanted to introduce the um, parabolic Carnac inequality is because of this very nice characterization of it given by Grigorian um, uh, Salaf Kost and then extended by um, Sturman Delmott. So there are various unexplained terms in this um, uh, theorem and don't worry, I will explain um, uh, what they all mean in the next few slides. So given suitable local regularity, the following three conditions are equivalent. First of all, we have the parabolic Harnack inequality. Next, we have Gaussian heat kernel bounds. And thirdly, um, we have the, the, space, the space X satisfies two conditions, volume doubling and a Poincaré inequality. So, well, it's a nice theorem that these three conditions are um, equivalent. Um, uh, it'd be even nicer, perhaps, if we understand what those three conditions are. Um, and that's what I'm going to be telling you soon. So first of all, um, okay, so the next slides will tell you about that. And I'm going to be talking about this theorem in the context of um, weighted graphs, but the theorem also has version for manifolds produced by Sturm. Um, um, no, it was proved, sorry, the original version was proved for manifold, but manifolds by Gregorian and Salov cost. And then, um, Sturm generalized it to metric spaces, Delmott to graphs. All these conditions need some kind of local regularity. And in the case of um, weighted graphs, local regularity is given by a condition which I call controlled weights, which means that basically you can't have an edge with too small a probability of jumping along the edge. So we have this condition here. So now let me um, go into the um, task of explaining what these um, three conditions are. So first of all, Gaussian heat kernel bounds. So we're looking at a random walk on um, continuous time random walk on a graph. And here are what I mean by Gaussian bounds. So first of all, we, we let's look at the upper bound. The lower bound is of the same form, but different constants. The transition probability from X to Y um, has a term dxy squared divided by t, in other words, a standard Gaussian type term. We have here a term which involves, looks a little bit different. It involves the measure of the ball center x and radius about t to the one half. Mu a is the measure um, derived from the um, weights on the graph um, ax. And if we're looking in the situation where we have said d, and A are natural weights, then mu A of a ball is about R to the D. So this quantity here is going to be about a constant times T to the D over two. And so we would obtain the familiar Gaussian type term, T to the minus D over two, E to the minus DX squared over, over T. Um, because we're looking at graphs, um, if T is less than or equal to DXY, so in other words, the process has to jump from x to y um, in time little t. Remember that the jump rate from x from a point x to a point y is axy divided by ax. So the process that I've defined is jumping out of a point little x at rate one. So basically in time t, we would expect the process to make about little t steps. If t is smaller than dxy, the process has to move very rapidly. And in fact, the con biggest constraint on it getting from X to Y is not that it specifically gets to y, y, but it is just able to make little T step jumps in a short period of time. And so some fairly straightforward calculations show us that we no longer have Gaussian bounds and the dominant term, both for the upper bound and the lower bound is um, the tail of the Poisson distribution. So these are the Gaussian heat kernel bounds and they should be um, you know, fairly intuitive for um, any probabilist. Now we come on to um, the two more mysterious conditions, VD and PI. So here is volume doubling. So this is a statement about the geometry of the graph. It's saying that if we look at the measure of a ball of radius 2R, that measure is bounded by a constant times the measure of the ball of radius R. Most of the examples that we're looking at, mu a of a ball is going to be about the number of points in the ball. So we're saying that 
as if you sit at a point X and you look at a sequence of expanding balls center at where you are, you don't see the size of those balls increasing too dramatically. It's easy to check that this condition holds for ZD. And it's easy also to check that it implies polynomial volume growth. In other words, there exists a constant alpha such that, sorry, that should be mu A of BXR is less than some constant depending on X times R to the alpha. So graphs like the binary tree with exponential um, uh, growth are excluded by this condition. And now here's the Poincaré inequality. The Poincaré inequality says there exists a constant CP such that if we've got a function F, so here is some um, nice compressed notation. We write 2B for um, uh, the ball radius X naught and um, psi, um, uh, center X naught and radius 2R. And B should here be the uh, ball B XR. So F bar B is the average of F on B. And the condition here is that if we look at the sort of variance of F over the ball B, that is, is bounded by a constant key quantity here is R squared. And then we have this quantity here, which we can sort of think of as the energy of the function um, F on the ball um, 2B. And we can write that for short as CP R squared and this, this quantity here curly E to B F F. So that's the Poincaré inequality. So I think volume doubling is fairly easy to understand. What the Poincaré inequality is saying is not so clear. So let's go on and look at how one would prove it and the kind of statement it's making about the geometry of the graph. So usually when you prove a Poincaré inequality, you prove it from an isoparametric inequality. So here is a picture of a ball in sort of Euclidean space. We have a subset A of the ball, and this is B minus A. And the interface between A and B minus A is this red um, or purple um, line here. So we define F A B minus A to be the sum of all the edge weights going of edges which go from A to B minus A. And the isoparametric inequality is saying that this interface is not too small, so that this quantity here is bigger than mu A of A over R. If you think for a moment about um, RD <coughs> and a ball of radius um, R, the overall measure of the ball is going to be um, size R to the D. The size of um, the boundary is R to the D minus one and you see that the um, isoparametric inequality sort of intuitively um, at least should hold. And of course, there are many, many proofs of the isoparametric inequality for RD. Now, if you have the isoparametric inequality, um, you can prove the Poincaré inequality from it. Um, as with most of the proofs in this, these talks, I'm just going to give you a sketch giving a few of the ideas without going into technicalities. Supposing, for example, we take the function f to be the indicator of a set, then um, some calculations which are not too hard show us that the sum of f of x minus f bar absolute value with no square in it is about mu of a, and the sum over axy fx minus fy is exactly this curly f, I suppose, flux from a to b minus a. So the isoparametric inequality, which I showed you on the previous slide, implies what people call a 1-1 Poincaré inequality. In other words, they imply this relation here. So actually, there should be a little red one there too. We have the Poincaré inequality, but instead of powers of two, um, which the, was in what we saw before, we have powers of one. However, um, with a little bit of work, one can use well, the first thing is we've only proved it for the indicator of A. However, um, one can then extend this inequality to um, general F, um, something called the co-area formula, which enables us to do that. And then an appropriate use of Cauchy-Schwarz enables us to extract the 2-2 um, Poincaré inequality with squares there, there, and there from this 1-1 Poincaré inequality. 
to help you further understand the Poincaré inequality, um, in passing, let me remark that Yuval Perez suggested that Poincaré inequality should really be called a bottleneck inequality. Um, it's an inequality which in some sense tells you about the geometry of the graph that you can't have sort of bottlenecks in the space. Here to remind you in green is the statement of the Poincaré inequality. And here now is a graph for which the Poincaré inequality fails. Let's take two copies of ZD um, and sort of join them, of course, can't draw a picture of that, um, connect them at their origins, which I'm going to denote O1 and O2. We'll take a function f, which is one on one copy and minus one on the other. Um, let b be the ball center O1, shall we say, and radius r. Then the average of the function on over this um, ball b is about zero. And well, this ball has radius, um, has volume r cubed. And so th this sum here is about r cubed. On the other hand, the only edge on which the function f is non-constant is the little is the one edge between the two connect the, the two copies. So this quantity here is just f naught minus um, f naught prime. Actually, those should be zero, one, and zero, two, and that should be two, and that should be four, not one. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, you can see that um, this side is basically just a constant. So we get r squared there, and then we would want r cubed less than a constant r squared, which obviously fails. So we see the Poincaré inequality does not hold um, on this um, particular graph. It shouldn't surprise you that the elliptic Harnack inequality also fails for this graph. Remember that r3 is, or z3 is transient. Let's call the two copies of z3 v1 and v2. And we know the simple random walk on Z3 is trans transient. So if we think about simple random walk on this graph here, um, it may jump between the two copies a finite number of times, but ultimately it's going to wander off to infinity either in V1 or V2. So let's put H of X be the probability that the process is ultimately absorbed in V1. This is strictly between zero and naught and one for all points X. It's a harmonic function and it's non-constant. So the strong Liouville property fails. We saw the elliptic Harnack inequality implies the SLP. So the elliptic Harnack inequality must also fail. And actually using the same function, you would also, if you do a few calculations, see directly that um, the elliptic BHI fails and this function shows it. So <clears throat> Siva, I'm not quite sure. I think I'm getting to the end of my um, time for the first lecture, is, is that right? That's right, uh, maybe about five minutes at the most, if you want, if you want to stop okay. <clears throat> Let me just, um, I'm just going to look and see for a natural sort of breaking point. Um, I'm just, if this is, this may be a natural breaking point for the, okay, I can just go on um, a little bit more. <clears throat> so let's recall the um, parabolic Harnack inequality theorem. Uh, that we saw. So given suitable, suitable local regularity, the following three conditions are equivalent. The parabolic Harnack inequality, Gaussian heat kernel bounds, and satisfying volume doubling and Poincaré inequality. So we now know what those three conditions are saying. And in some sense, there are what we have here are two high level conditions the parabolic Harnack inequality and the Gaussian heat kernel bounds, and one low level condition, volume doubling and Poincaré inequality. And I've sketched to you how, for example, for um, ZD, um, we can prove VD and the Poincaré inequality. <clears throat> if for a moment we think about simple random walk on ZD, well, there are lots and lots of techniques for um, uh, studying it. Um, because we've got, because the process xt is a sum of independent random variables, we can use um, Fourier techniques. And so it's certainly possible to prove the Gaussian heat kernel bounds directly um, in that method. Proving conditions A or, or B for, by direct means on most graphs is going to be really troublesome. <clears throat> Proving the two the conditions involved in 
um, C, in other words, volume doubling, which is, uh, and the Poincare inequality, as we've seen, those both boil down to proving certain geometric statements about the graph. Volume doubling, we just need to look at the size of balls. The Poincare inequality is a bit more. We need to look at balls and we need to prove some kind of isoparametric inequality on the ball. So just going back for a moment to the picture here, we need to show that whenever we've got a ball and a subset of the ball, then the boundary between the two, um, uh, bet between the two sets um, is, is not, is not too small. So it involves some more delicate geometric work on the um, on, on the geometry of the graph, but still um, it's a sort of geometry rather than um, uh, probability. So now let's start by saying why is this theorem useful? And um, here is um, a, a first example. So what we are looking at here is um, a nice copy, which I stole from somewhere on the web of um, a Penrose tiling. So remember that this is an aperiodic um, uh, um, tiling of um, uh, R2. So the Penrose tiling gives a non-periodic bounded degree graph, which I'm gonna call G pen, which is embedded in R2. If we think about the random walk on this graph, we can either think of it as stand going from tile to tile, but maybe more naturally from um, vertex to vertex. So here it's can jump in one of five ways. We're going to look at, in this case, at natural weights. Some vertices have weight three here. I think there are some with weight seven or eight. Um, anyway, from each vertex, the, the graph jumps um, with equal probability to one of the neighbors. So we, we would naturally expect that um, this continuous time simple random walk on this graph is going to have similar long-term behavior to the random walk on um, Z2. We'd expect, for example, it to be, for it to be recurrent. Um, but um, the, is there a probabilistic proof of this? Um, thinking of one, I, I can't really um, think of how one would handle this um, graph by probabilistic means. We can't use any kind of sum of independent random variables methods because um, the tiling is non-periodic, so we don't have any kind of periodic structure here. However, if we use the Gregorian Solov cost sturm delmott theorem, um, it's easy to show that we get Gaussian bounds for this process. So this is how we go. Um, first of all, um, if we look back at the tiles, each tile has, um, well, there, there are two different kinds of tiles. The volume of a tile is um, bounded above and below by constants. And so it's easy to use that to show that the size of a ball in this graph here um, is bounded above and below by constants times R squared. And so you, once you've got this, volume doubling comes out straightforward fashion. Um, with a bit more work, one can prove the isoparametric inequality for GPEN. The basic idea would be that if there were a bad set for GPEN, in other words, you had a ball with a set with a small interface between the, the set A and the rest of the ball, then one could construct a similar bad set for um, Z2. So <clears throat> volume doubling and the isoparametric inequality hold for GPEN. By the arguments that I've shown you, therefore, the conditions volume doubling and Poincare inequality also hold for GPEN. And then we now use the Grigorian solov cost theorem, or perhaps I'll call it the parabolic Harnack inequality theorem, PHI theorem, to show that we get Gaussian bounds. And I think this is probably a good place for me to um, end my first lecture. Okay. Uh, maybe people can ask questions by unmuting themselves at the end of the first talk. Hello, sir? Yes. Sir, can you briefly explain this line? If there were a bad set for GPEN, then one could construct a similar bad set for Z2. I'd like to know what is the thinking behind that particular line? Okay, I have not thought through it. Um, so it's a, 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 actually a, a good exercise. Let me see if I can um, now. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, no, that's okay. I need a. I need my whiteboard. Oh yes, here we are. Okay. Uh, is that? Okay. So, <laughs> uh, now. Uh, So, um, Siba, I'm, what do I do to get to the whiteboard? Um, uh, you have to stop sharing, uh, stop sharing the screen, desktop, and then go to the whiteboard. Maybe um, I should just, um, maybe I'm going to fiddle around um, on this picture here. It may or may not work nicely, but let's give it a go. Um, uh, draw. Uh, is this the, yes. <laughs> So supposing we've got a, let's see how we can manage this. So we've, supposing we've got a ball here um, in uh, G pen, and supposing we've got um, a bad set here. So this is the set A. Be better if I wasn't drawing in green, but there we are. B minus A. So what I would mean by a bad set here is a set with moderately big volume and where this interface here in the graph G pen between A and B minus A is small. So if we, have, if we had such a set, then the idea would be to say, well, we look for example at all those tiles which intersect this set here. And we would argue that if we count up the um, number of tiles which intersect, um, uh, well, for, <clears throat> for each of these tiles, we would want to argue that we can find a, an edge from this tile. Um, okay, given the tile, we would find we would want to find a point in Z2, um, which is fairly close to the tile. We take an edge of, shall we say, if you think of these tiles as having edge length one, we would look for an edge um, uh, of length, shall we say, six or something, in other words, big enough to um, not to ignore the sort of local structure of the Penrose thing. And we'd look for an, a, an edge from here to here, which takes us from, um, uh, uh, from A to B minus A. And then <clears throat> we, we, of course, may be counting edges and a number of times, but the basic idea would be to, we use this idea to build some um, subset of um, Z2 and something which is more roughly a ball in um, Z2, where the same bad properties of having um, a small interface um, hold as in the original set. Sorry. Um, uh, it's, it, I'm, I'm only giving you a rather rough idea of, 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 of how one would go it, and um, uh, the details would be a bit messy, but not, I think, um, uh, hopelessly messy. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Ah. <laughs> Okay, if not, uh, we will take a five minute break and start at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, India time. That's about. Okay, thanks. 